Hi guys! So this presentation is about how to be an independent artist here in the Philippines. It's about how to make a living or to be more concrete. It's how you can earn money by selling your artworks or creative services. Now I do have limitations for this talk. I'm gonna stick first with fine art practice and this is your drawing and painting. Could be traditional or digital. It's basically what you've learned in our techniques class. You can also apply this to sculpture and photography as long as it follows a fine art approach. Other practices like design, those who are asking about logos and book illustrations, I'm sorry but um, they do have their own industry and they work very differently. Kind of similar but like they do taxes, um, royalties, etc. So I won't include that in this presentation. You'll probably have lessons for it in your following years anyway. Okay, so I'll get right to it. I'm going to start with explaining the importance of having a series. I know for our techniques class we explore all types of media and all types of subjects. And that's part of learning your craft, for sure. But when coming out to the world with your art, it's best to present yourself with a unified series of artworks. Through a series, you're able to present an identity that's your own. So the main factor in making a series is having a unified theme. You can actually start with just a set of three and you can call that a series. There are many ways to make it unified, usually by sticking to one medium or the size of the work or subject, technique, color palette, visual elements like maybe you want to keep on putting shapes in the background, those kinds. But it's not necessarily all of it at the same time. I'm going to show you samples in a bit. The objective here is that you are consistent and you can do it again and again. Um, this is just an extra thought, but making a series shows that you didn't just get lucky in making one good work. Like, if you made one nice one, there is a possibility that it was done by chance. <laughs> so your proof of being able to do it again is by showing three or more. This leads to the importance of developing a personal style and finding your own voice. And through that, people can easily identify you among other artists in the industry. When starting out, you can totally take inspiration from other artists, of course, I mean, but not completely down to the last brushstroke or something. But just try to make it with your own story. And I'm sure even subconsciously, your, your own handprint will show in the end. And what I mean by that is, I'm sure the way you stroke your brush is different from the artist, your choice of colors, it will show and you will be able to make it your own. So here is how I started. On the left is a work by Egon Schiele and I really love his work. I like the distortion of his figures and his line work so I know what parts of it that I like. So I took inspiration from that and made my own using watercolor and tech pen. I had my own story too. I painted this after watching an orchestra concert, which really moved me. And since I used to play the violin, I missed the feeling of it. And so I painted a man playing the violin. It's, it's that simple. It's a little somber and kind of sad. Anyway, I liked it a lot. And I used those same elements to make more, which evolved as I progressed. And you can see here, um, it became more colorful. It became more feminine. While the theme of being alone and somber and kind of sad still stayed there. That was 2013 and as the series picked up, it changed again and I focused now on the female figure, still with watercolor, but bigger and even more colorful. And in time I shifted to oil paint on canvas and made my first exhibit called Hero. Um, the look has changed a lot, but you could still see some elements where I started with, which is the bold line work, the expressive and sort of distorted figures, and my choice of color palette. Okay, I must say, all of us have our own styles and our own interests in subject matter, and it's best for us to work on our own strengths as well. So, you can do this with abstract, with portraits, if you just want to draw hands, then just draw hands. If you want everything in one color, go ahead and do that. What you should try is to experiment and once you find something you like, focus on that and develop it in time. 
So the next thing before we go to the pricing is knowing your worth. What is the value of art in the first place? What is the value for you as the artist and for the buyer? Of course, for you, it's your passion. It's your calling. It's what you want to do for the rest of your life, right? And you're spending years of studying it and practicing it. So you should take that into account so that you know the weight of it and the amount of work and passion involved in making your art. Now for the buyer's side, there are a lot of people who appreciate art and understand its importance. It uplifts them, it reminds them of their younger years, or it simply makes them happy to see art. So these are the people you should focus on, and I'm telling you that they exist. It may be difficult for us to think in the shoes of a buyer, because we are the artists. We can make art out of nothing, but they can't, so they are willing to buy it. If they like your work and like your style, if they think that it fits them and their personality, that's enough reason for them to buy it from you. Another factor is that they treat art as an investment. Now, I know how negative this can sound, thinking that some collectors do buy just to earn interest. But for most collectors and buyers, I do understand this part. It's still a big amount of money and they just want a bit of assurance that the value of the art they acquired will increase in time. And one way to determine that is by watching the artist grow and continue to make art and continue improving. I think this is really part of it and it's inseparable. I know the collector will be more proud of buying your work now knowing that you are doing your best and because the buyer supported your work financially, you now have the capacity to continue and be better. I think it's a good give and take, really. So these are the two points of view you should keep in mind, both the value for yourself as the artist and the value for the buyer. This will give you a better perspective and maybe give you more confidence in pursuing a career in art. Okay, one more thing. I just want to be clear on the differences between commission work and personal work. For commissions, it's the client who asks you to make a work for them. The most usual would be a portrait, but it could be anything really, as long as you're following the direction or the vision of the client, like maybe they want it a certain size or they want it a certain color, you just follow that. For personal work, it's something you make for yourself and you follow your own direction in any style, in any subject. You do it out of your own initiative and then maybe you decide you want to sell it. To show you exactly what I do, I do portraits for commissions in sort of a fun impressionist style and the personal works are what I showed you earlier. The styles are very different and I treat it differently too. So for the portraits, it's all about the buyer I make sure it looks like them and that they like the colors and the mood is based on their personality. For my personal work, I do what I want, so since I love painting bodies, that's what I do. And I don't care what others think, I do everything for myself and it's my story. And then I show it to the public and hopefully someone wants to buy it. <laughs> Sometimes personal work can lead to commissions, like at the top right, the three watercolor girls, it's actually a commission. and. The buyer had one request and it was just she wanted three paintings and I said okay I paint what I want as long as she gets three and that was cool I think that was a nice balance of freedom for commission work so you can stick to one or you can try both okay so we're finally here so there are many factors in determining your price it's not just one thing and you have to find what works for you and what works for your market. It's good to have a concrete basis and not just basing your price on feelings so that you carry that credibility with you throughout your career. There are two ways to compute it. The first would be using the material cost and this takes into account the cost of all your materials like the paper, pencil, brushes and paint and you multiply the total by around 5 to 10 if you're starting out or if you're more established, maybe 10 to 20. And it also depends on how long it takes to make it. The second would be using a price per square inch. And this is by getting the area of your work and multiplying it to a set price. 
Most artists here in the Philippines, as well as most galleries I know, they base their rates on the price per square inch. You can also call it PSI. It's really just the easiest, and it's what I use as well, but I also take into account my material cost, making sure it's all justifiable. So I'm going to focus all our pricing based on the PSI computation. The formula is area times PSI, and you get the area by multiplying the length times width of your artwork. If you're working on a 3D sculpture, you include the height, so that's length times width times height. If I don't have the actual work, or like I'm just estimating, I find it helpful to lay it out on Illustrator this way, to visually see the differences in sizes. Um, I just use a standard height of the person. He's about 5 feet 4 inches tall. And you call this an elevation. It's very useful for bigger works. For the price, um, when starting out, the lowest would be around 15 to 20 pesos. And hopefully you don't go below that. The medium you're using also plays a big part. Um, this is just a generalized industry standard from what's priced lowest to highest. So you start with the inks and charcoals, which are priced lower, and then you go higher when you get to colored media, like colored pencils and soft pastel. And it goes higher when you get to the paints, like watercolor and acrylic, and the most expensive would be oil paint. Um, this is what the galleries and collectors usually expect, but nothing is set in stone. At all. So if you're an ink artist, your work can be just as much as the other artist's watercolor, and some watercolor artists price much higher than other oil paintings. Maybe when you're starting out, people would expect you to follow this hierarchy, but if you stay consistent and build a following, I mean, you can totally break it. For example, let's use a 9 by 12 inch charcoal portrait. So you get the area by multiplying 9 times 12, and you get 108. And then let's try out using the lowest price of 15 pesos. That's your price per square inch. So you multiply 108 times 15, you get 1,620. Um, let's just drop the 20 and round it off to the nearest hundreds. It's more convenient that way. So if you're comfortable with this, then go use that. If not, you can raise your price. Let's try it with... 20 PSI, you'll get 2,200 pesos. If you go higher, let's try 50 PSI, you'll get 5,400. And if you go even higher to 80 PSI, you'll get 8,600 pesos. So these are the prices you can choose from. I actually would use smaller increments for the PSI, like I do 20, 25, 30, and then choose from that. Let's do another example with, let's say, an acrylic painting with a size 15 by 20 inches. So you multiply that and you get 300 for your area. And then let's multiply it with the same set of PSI. And this is what we get. So do you think you can sell your acrylic painting for 4,500 pesos? Or do you think it should be at least 6,000? Do you think it's possible that you sell it for 15000 if you market it really well? Or how about let's set a goal that if you keep at it in about 3 years, I think you can sell it for 24000 If you're wondering how to do this for digital art, it's nice if you could sell prints. This way you can base your price on the print size, just like this. It's a bit easier to visualize thinking of it printed at a certain size on paper or on canvas. Or if you're doing it completely digital and mainly offering a digital file like a JPEG. Like I know some artists who make portrait illustrations and the buyers mainly use it for their Facebook profile, which is really fun. You can maybe equate it to how large the pixel size of your work is. If it's small and meant to be for a profile image, that means your detail work is limited to viewing it at a small size, compared to a large work meant to be for like a wallpaper of a website. It's a little tricky and this gets more into illustration work and crosses their whole industry, which is very different from traditional painting. So this should be tackled with a completely different presentation. You'll get to that more in your succeeding years in FA. Okay, let's do one last example. And this time, we're going to try to price three different sizes using the same medium. Let's say you want to present different size options for the buyer to choose from. 
So we have a 9 by 12, a 15 by 20, and a 20 by 30. And let's try it with a 20 PSI. And here's what we get. The smallest is 2,200, the medium is 6,000, and the biggest is 12,000. Um, technically, this works, but you might think, let's say you're doing a portrait. For the smallest size, although yes, the size is small, but the effort in doing it is just as hard as the bigger ones. So, para medyo lugi. In this case, it's usual and acceptable to increase the PSI of smaller works. So, I'll try and raise it up a bit and make it 30 PSI, and now we have 3,000 pesos, which is much better. Now, looking at the largest one, at 12,000 pesos, the price is correct, but it may seem very high. What do you think? You may not be sure if the buyer would pay that much. Also for me, I'm not saying this for everyone. Um, when I paint a portrait, it's not that much of a difference in effort in painting a large portrait compared to a medium portrait. So what I do is I lower the PSI for the largest size so that the price isn't super high. So how about I lower this to 15 PSI and now we have 9,000. It's not super high anymore. Also, so that buyers will be more inclined to getting the biggest one, which in the end still gives you a bigger amount. So looking at the new prices, 3K, 6K, and 9K, this seems like a better range compared to the first one. Anyway, please know that I'm computing all of this using the lowest PSI. You can go higher if you want, definitely, if you can. Now when presenting your prices to the buyer, you don't show the PSI. It's not that you're trying to hide something. I mean, it's, it's very easy to figure it out. Like you just divide the price to the area and you get the PSI. The reason for this is, other than you don't need to, and you're not required to, you just don't want people to nitpick on the details, especially since it's only you who thought of the reasons to determine the price. Again, there's no need to show this at all. For some other factors in pricing, um, this is for portraits. Let's say someone wants to ask for two heads or two faces in one frame. That's definitely much more effort than just doing one. and <laughs> It's actually nearly double the work. So you can start with the original price and add 50% for the extra head if you're working with two heads. If you're working for about three or more heads, this is assuming that the faces will now have to be sized smaller so that they can all fit. So maybe you can add 30% for each head. Anyway, these percentages can vary. What's important here is that you have a formula where you can base everything on, and it's not just a guess. And you can stay consistent for a variety of requests. So you'll know how to answer for two heads, and you'll know how to answer for five heads. Try making a chart like what I did earlier and pick where you're most comfortable at. For frameworks, yes, you should add the framing cost on top of the original price of the artwork. This is separate and you can list this down in numbers to show the client so that they know exactly how much is added for the frame. You should also include other service costs, not just the frame, like what you spent for the transportation when you had it framed or the framer's delivery fee. Everything included in framing. For others though, and this applies for more expensive works, they already include it in their price. So they'll say, oh, the painting is priced at 15000 and it already comes for the frame. And lastly, there's so many factors to consider in pricing. Like for how long you spent painting it, or is it black and white, is it colored, and is your technique so much more complicated, are you working on a lot of intricate details, ang dami no? And then there's the logistics, like for the photography. And then there's the delivery. And then sometimes they want to do meetings, like if ever you have to see their house first, something like that. Lastly, there's a website, if you have one. I pay for my website every year. So it's a lot, yeah. So how can you tell if you have the right price? I think the best way to do it is by testing it out. So let's say for your first batch of commissions, um, if someone says no and tells you, you know what, your price is too high, maybe there is a chance that it's only them who can't afford it and they're just not the right person. 
But if two people or three or more say no, and you should know that ghosting and not answering is a no, <laughs> and this goes on for a few months, then yes, that is a sign that for the kind of market you're able to reach, that shows that your price is too high and you'll have to adjust and make it lower. If people say yes, well, that's great. Even if it's just one person who says yes, that's a good sign that you may be on the right track. If you continue to get more and more buyers, then suddenly you can't keep up with the orders, then that's also a sign that you can raise your price. Uh, but do this very gradually. Uh, don't shock them. Anyway, try it out, test it, see how the buyers react, and then you adjust. There's no other way to know until you try it out. Okay, this is important. You have to be clear with your payment terms. Always ask for a 30% to 50% down payment upfront, in cash or check or bank deposit, whichever. If you're doing a commission, they need to pay a down payment before you start. If you're selling a series of a finished work that's hanging in an exhibit, let's say for a long time, they need to pay a down payment to keep it reserved for them. You should give a confirmation receipt, and it's as simple as replying to an email stating that Thank you for your deposit. I received a total of 5,000 pesos as down payment for the painting. Just word it out so that it's clear that you received the exact amount. And that's good enough. I know it feels weird, and you'll probably feel anxious to ask for down payment, but you should know that this is a very normal procedure among all art buyers. The reason for this is that a down payment benefits both you and the buyer. It assures you that the buyer won't cancel on you, and it assures the client that you will do your job on time and in good quality. So it's a two-way relationship, and there's nothing arrogant or demanding in asking for a down payment. Afterwards, they should give the full payment upon delivery. In no way do you give the piece without them paying in full, okay? Just don't. Most of the time, clients will gladly accept and respect your payment terms. However, there are some buyers who would still suggest different payment terms, but you should still stick to your own. I've had experience where someone insisted on paying after one month, and I just said, um, I'm sorry, I have to follow my terms to be fair with everyone. Say no gracefully, don't get mad, don't blame them. <laughs> And don't take it personally. How about discounts though? Uh, discounts work depending on who's asking for it. You can give discounts. At times, I believe you should. And at times, I think you shouldn't. If you've been selling for some time and then someone you don't know asks for a discount randomly, um, I don't think you should give it. But then if someone's asking you for three or more pieces all at once, they can. But it's not a must. It's not something you just willingly offer. Just because they're getting three or more doesn't mean automatically that they get a discount. Only when they ask. And it's possible that you can give a discount for about 5-10%. to 10 You think that's reasonable? If it's your first time ever to sell, like it's your first ever series and it's the first time releasing it at this price and someone suddenly wants a discount, and you think, why not? Um, then you should. Pricing for me is mostly dependent on how comfortable you are with it. So if giving a discount eases the pressure and anxiety in doing it for the first time, then go ahead. If it's family, uh, <laughs> I guess. If someone from your family is buying from you, they could get a discount, like 10%. If it's really a close friend, yeah, same, why not? But as always, it's not mandatory. If you do give a discount, this is how you should do it. When giving the price, you don't show them the discounted price right away. That's not the first thing you show. You should give the full price, you explain it, and then you say, since you're a family member or since you're getting three or more, I'm giving you a 10% discount, and then you give the total price. This way, it's very important that they know the real price of your work and it's clear how much lower they're getting it for. That way, the value of your work isn't lost and it's not compromised. A few last tips. 
A lot of artists are intimidated with giving their rates and are afraid of asking for payments. It's normal, but it's something we all have to overcome. It's really part of life, and you need to do it to keep your art alive. Have it to know more and find confidence in yourself? Go out and ask the price ranges available. Okay, maybe not now. Naka quarantine tayo eh. Anyway, ask other artists, ask the buyers and gallery owners, and then you'll find out who are pricing the highest, who are pricing the lowest, and who are in the middle. And then you figure out where you want to belong. Maybe it will take time for you to reach the highest or even the middle, but at least you know where to go and you know how to. And last you know, it's all about adjusting in time. If you make a mistake, actually that's good that you did it now. You did it early. You can make all the mistakes while it's still early. And when you do, you move on and improve right away. You'll get used to it in time. Okay, that's all for now. There's still so much to talk about. I'm just taking a while to finish these videos. It's so hard. <laughs> for the second half, I'll talk about how to sell. There's so much about the way you communicate it to people. And then how to promote your work. And the pitch. How to write it in an email for them to say yes. And then how to work on your branding. So that's all going to come in the next few weeks. <laughs> for now, how about you try and price some of your works. Let's say maybe one of your plates in class. Or whatever you've been working on really. Even without anyone asking you yet. Try it out. Try and set a price for it. Okay, see you next time.